Hi, my name is David Warner Matheson, and I write and teach about the world's ancient wisdom imparted to our ancestors in the ancient myths, scriptures, and sacred stories given to every culture on our planet, on every inhabited continent and island. Today I'd like to talk about a very widespread misunderstanding, a very important subject. There's a very widespread trope, which I hear asserted as unassailable fact by many guests on independent media outlets, such as podcasts, that one of the biggest problems in the world today has to do with central bank money creation being the uh, source of debt-based money, which comes along with interest payments, and in that if all the money created comes with interest payments, then we can never pay back those interest payments because every new dollar or whatever currency is created, every new uh, creation of money adds more interest and we will always be behind and therefore we'll always be in debt and it's a huge trap. It's all this gigantic system that's a huge trap to enslave us or to oppress us. As an example, here's a meme posted recently by the real Lee Camp on his Instagram account. And the meme says, quote, the moment money is created, it is debt. Therefore, by definition, there is trillions of dollars, represented by dollar signs, more debt. Therefore, by definition, there's trillions of dollars more debt in the world than can ever be repaid. The top 1% live richly while in debt. Look at Donald Trump. The rest, meanwhile, lose their homes, cars, and sometimes freedom, end quote. I have no doubt that Lee Camp means well in posting this meme, or at least I hope he does. I have no doubt that he's arguing against injustice and for greater justice in the world, but he has the mechanism wrong. The problem is not what is being laid out in this meme. In fact, this meme and this argument, which did not originate with Lee Camp, but it's one that you can hear on independent media being declared by guests going back for many years, is very misleading. To understand why it's misleading, you need to understand an important distinction between money creation by governments and money creation by privatized credit creation agents, namely the banks, most importantly, banks. That distinction is not mentioned anywhere in this meme, but it's actually the heart of the subject of money creation in the modern time. Notice that the meme, as it's put forward, does not mention this distinction anywhere. And, and, and the meme, as it's, as it's shown in this slide, doesn't have any solution. It doesn't offer any solution. It simply sees money as entirely negative because as it declares, the moment money is created, it's debt. And so the creation of money is always a problem, resulting in more debt in the world than can ever be repaid. And, you know, rich people can just live with that and everyone else can't. That's actually not, there is a problem, but it's not putting its finger on the problem. It's mistaken by the very definition of debt. It, it doesn't give you a complete understanding of the picture because it doesn't give you a complete understanding of what debt is. Debt is never a one-sided thing. Anyone who's ever taken even the most basic accounting course knows that if I owe someone a debt, that will show up on my balance sheet as a liability. But in accounting, everything has to balance. That liability always has its opposite somewhere else. My debt that I owe someone is actually an asset on the balance sheet of whomever I owe that debt to. Every liability, every debt is an asset when seen from a different angle. It's like they're two sides of the same coin, but actually a better metaphor, the best metaphor that I can come up with to explain this concept is not two sides of a coin, it's the two sides of a traffic light. If one direction in an intersection is going to have a green light, then the other direction of traffic in that intersection simply 
has to have a red light. Saying you want to create a, a liability without an asset or an asset without a liability, saying you want to create money without debt is like saying you want to have a green light without a corresponding red light. A green light for one direction has to come with, automatically comes along with a red light for the opposite direction and vice versa. So keep this in mind for accounting and for the discussion about money creation. The real question is, who is going to end up with the liability? And that points us towards the solution to this dilemma that the meme is posting. When money is created, there is a creation of a liability and a creation of an asset. They go together, like the traffic light. For instance, if you refinance your home, you assume a liability and the bank gets an asset. That liability on your balance sheet, that liability part is an asset to the bank or to whomever they then sell your loan to, which is what usually happens. It's an asset to the creditor because it represents an agreement that you've signed by which you have agreed to pay back that money that, that you got with interest in regular payments that happen every month for 30 years or whatever stipulated in the agreement that's signed by both parties. So it ends up as a liability on your balance sheet, which you're slowly paying off, and an asset to who, whomever ends up purchasing that, that uh, loan. It's an asset to them because it's payments rolling in from you. It's two things at once, just like a, a traffic light. But there's two ways to create money. And that's the critical important point that this common meme that we're talking about completely omits, completely leaves out of the discussion. I suspect that whoever came up with this misleading lie about all money creation having debt that creates interest that can never be paid back, that's wrong. Whoever came up with that way of expressing it probably left out this important point deliberately because it was probably originally created by the opponents of the primary form of money creation. The two forms of money creation are, number one, the primary form is government, governments create it into existence. And then number two is banks, which are like the authorized agents of the government, which have been given this like monopoly power, can also create it into existence in the form of loans. And the difference between these two is simply enormous, and you must understand it. The difference comes down to where that liability ends up. We've already seen that when a bank creates money into existence by creating a loan and then selling it to you over your signature, you end up with the liability on your balance sheet. You owe interest to whoever has that loan as an asset on their balance sheet, originally the bank, and then to whomever they sell it, so they can receive your payments, including interest. There's nothing wrong with this setup, um, but it only works as long as whatever you borrowed the money for can create enough cash flow for you to cover that interest or the to service that liability, to service that debt is how it's expressed. But let's stay focused on these two different ways to create money into existence. When the government creates it, the liability ends up in a very different place. When government creates money, you end up with the asset, or someone in the private sector ends up with the asset, and who ends up with the liability? Where does it end up sitting? Whose balance sheet? It sits on the government's balance sheet. They end up with the liability. Your asset, the money, is the government's liability. When someone talks about the national debt, the liability of the government, that liability corresponds to the assets that it's created out into the private sector. And the important thing to understand is, the critically important thing to understand about this liability of the government is that they don't owe you interest on it unless they choose to voluntarily 
give you interest payments in addition to the asset that they created. You, you don't get interest payments on a bunch of cash that's sitting in your pocket, for example. But that is a, it's a liability of the government, but they're not paying any interest on it. So to say that creating asset money creates an interest requirement, and by the way, the asset money, of course, it comes with a liability somewhere, and that liability is sitting with the government. So it is debt money as well. It's a liability and it's an asset. But to say that that automatically creates an interest requirement is just flat wrong. The government can create assets, and those assets do come with a corresponding liability on their balance sheet, but they do not have to pay interest on it. There's no law of physics that forces them to pay interest on that liability. That liability uh, can be essentially thought of as a tax credit extended from them to you. You give back the asset when you pay taxes and they extinguish the tax liability. So there's a connection between money creation and taxes and you can read about that elsewhere. But and I've talked about that also in some previous videos. So what people should be talking about what people should really be focusing in on is the creation of money by banks versus the creation of money by government, with the government being a shorthand for the elected representatives of the people in a democracy or in a representative government. In the United States, for example, the creation of money is a power that is stipulated in the Constitution as belonging to Congress, the most democratic of the three branches of the government, the body with the most elected representatives of the entire population. So you must understand this difference between these two forms of money creation. One carries an interest payment and one does not. When the bank creates a liability for you, they demand an interest payment because they have to stay in business. But if the government creates money, an asset, it does not need to get interest payments. The government creates the money out of thin air and it doesn't need interest payments in order to stay in business. It can always create money whenever it needs to. So the government money creation, it creates a liability, but it's not sitting on your balance sheet out in the private sector. It's sitting in the public balance sheet in the government sector. And it there's a liability in either case, but it's very different where that liability sits and whether there's interest attached to it or not. And the more that the government doesn't spend, the more that money is going to get created by privately owned banks who charge interest on the assets that they create. And so there's your problem. If government isn't spending enough, the people, the private sector, ends up having to take on more debt created by banks instead of spent out into the world by government. And that credit created by banks comes along with interest obligations that are written into the contract. You can think about an example. If government doesn't fund college education, for instance, the people are going to end up with more student debt than they would if government funded some college option, say public universities. And that's what we see in the US today, although not in Europe. Those student debt loans, they're a liability for the student and an asset for the bank. And you better believe they come with interest payments. But if the government had said, as governments do in other countries all over Europe, for example, and Scandinavia, we're going to fund college tuition for qualified citizens as part of our infrastructure, part of what we need in order to enable productivity and reduce the cost of doing business. Then those students and their parents won't have to take out student loans from private banks. And so here's an important point. When the government created the money to pay for those tuitions, it doesn't owe any interest on that money. It just creates the asset in the account of the college or the university that provides the college education. And the liability would be a liability of the government, but it wouldn't necessarily have to pay anyone any interest payments on that liability. Any more than the government pays you interest on a $10 bill that you're carrying around in your wallet. You can carry that $10 bill around 
all you want. You can wait for 100 years, but the government will never pay you any interest on that $10 bill. It'll still be $10 100 years from now. So the other important thing to note is if the government decides not to create the money, in the case of the college tuition funding, then that shortfall will end up being picked up by bank money creation in the form of bank loans. If I'm a qualified student who wants to go get a, a college education and the government pays for that tuition or subsidizes that tuition, the liability ends up on the government balance sheet and they do that because they believe it's a benefit to society, just like providing any other form of infrastructure such as roads or post offices or ports. If the government chooses not to do that, then I have to pay for the education with money from my accounts, with assets that I have in my accounts. And if I don't have enough assets to cover the tuition, then I have to go to the bank and take out a student loan, which means that the bank will create an asset in my account. And in return, they'll also create a liability in my account. And that liability will correspond to an asset for the bank or for whomever that bank sells my student loan to as a source of regular cash flows for the next several years or decades. They might sell it to a hedge fund or some investor. Governments create money by government spending. Let's say they want to buy a tank or an aircraft carrier or a new highway that hasn't been built yet. They want to, they want to build a highway and they want to buy the labor and materials needed to make that highway. The company that makes the highway or that makes the tank gives the government the tank and the government creates an asset in the bank account of the tank company for $300 million or whatever the tank costs. The same for whoever builds the road for the government. They lay the asphalt and the government puts an asset in their bank account. Same for the college that creates the college course. They provide the college course for some citizens and the government puts an asset in their bank account. And that's how the government creates money. They spend it into existence and they create a corresponding liability on their balance sheet. But when governments don't spend enough, then there's going to be a corresponding rise in banks creating money. And banks loan money into existence that comes with interest payments. And they put the liability on your balance sheet and it's an asset on their balance sheet. And if the government doesn't cover college tuitions at public colleges the way they used to do, you can go have a look at the founding charter at the University of California at Berkeley, for example. If the government doesn't pay for that, then a whole lot more student loans are going to be created by banks, which is the situation that you have today in the United States. Now, the next thing you're going to hear is that, oh, government shouldn't create money because it will cause inflation. Who do you think is promoting that false narrative? Well, the bank lobby is a, is a potential promoter of that false narrative because they make their living off of loaning money which creates an asset for the bank and so the more that the government doesn't spend the more that they are going to be able to fill in that gap just like with the student loans that didn't even exist when i was going to college in my era there were there was not this in massive number of student loans the way there is today now in a previous video there's another dynamic to this in a previous video, I explained the direct connection between the level of government spending and the level of employment in a society. If there is unemployment, then that means that the government is either taxing too much or spending too little or both. They're not spending enough to match the taxation level that they have set. Let me say it again. Unemployment is directly related to government spending and taxation. Unemployment in a society is a sure sign that taxes are too high and spending is too low. Unemployment is a scourge on society. It is an unequivocal evil. It has no, nothing good to say for it. It leads to destruction of society. It leads to depression in men and women. It leads to the degradation of the family and the family function. And it leads to the breakup of families. And it leads to impoverishment of men and women and children. And it leads to all manner of ills. It leads to crime. It leads to homelessness. It leads to 
illness that goes untreated. It leads to polarization and extreme politics, extremism. It leads to the embrace of fascism, which we saw during the first half of the 20th century. It leads to desperation. Anyone who is complaining about too much government spending when we have people lying in the streets, homeless and unemployed, and people in society unemployed and unable to find work, involuntarily unemployed. If you're arguing that government shouldn't spend, that argument is completely without any moral basis. You cannot argue for less government spending unless we're already at full employment, period. Or it's an immoral argument, period. You're arguing for unemployment, and there's no moral way to argue for the imposition of unemployment on a society. In the end, the government spending and creation of money is constrained by resources. In the ancient wisdom given to every culture on our earth, the resources of a nation are described as gifts from the divine realm. The riches of the sea are given by the god of the sea. The riches of the fields are given by the goddess of the harvest. The riches of the earth, the, uh, the minerals under the earth, belong to the gods of the underworld. The blessing of rain is given by the gods of the sky. The olive tree is specifically described in Greek myth as the particular gift of the goddess Athena to men and women, and so on. The resources are given by the gods as blessings to the people in a land. And the institution of governments, whether it's government by a king or a queen or government by democracy, is for the purpose of preserving those gifts for the benefit of the people, for the benefit of the entire land, to preserve them and protect them from being fenced off and captured by oligarchs or oligarchs. It's pronounced both ways, oligarchy or oligarchy. The purpose of the king in the ancient times or the purpose of the democratic government in ancient times was to stand against oligarchy, which is the capturing of those resources by a small group for their benefit instead of for the benefit of everybody. Thus, the money function, which is tied to the resources, was anciently associated with the king and with the gods because the money function is a representation of those resources which are given by the gods and protected from oligarch capture by the king or in a democracy by all the people. If you look at ancient coins, you'll see that they're engraved with images of kings and images of gods and goddesses. Now, the most important of all the resources given to a nation by the divine realm are the men and women whom the divine realm allows to be born into that land and the gifts that are bestowed on those men and women. That's the most important resource of all, more important than any of the other natural resources of a land. And those gifts given to men and women are unequivocally described as coming from the divine realm, having the divine realm as their source and fountain in the world's ancient myths. And so that's why forcing unemployment, that's another reason why forcing unemployment on the people of a land is so horrendous because it prevents the expression and the full realization of the potential of those gifts, which the world's ancient myths universally describe as being given by the gods. Underemployment is also bad for the same reason, where men and women are unable to express their full potential. They're unable to, to find employment that enables them to really live up to their full potential. That's underemployment. So I've explained in another video the mechanism by which we can see that unemployment and underemployment are created by too much taxation in relation to spending. If you have unemployment and underemployment in an economy, it's an indication that you're taxing too much in relation to government spending. And the way to cure that is to tax less and spend more. And when governments spend more, 
they create more money and they, they simply create it as an asset in an account and a liability in another account. An asset in a private account, a liability in a public account. And when the government wants to build a road or a skate park or a bike path, it pays for all the materials and most importantly for the labor and the engineering simply by creating an asset in the bank account of those who provide those materials and that labor. And that comes with a liability, but it's a liability of the treasury of the government. It doesn't come with a requirement to pay interest. The government can choose to pay interest if it desires to, but there's no law of accounting or law of physics or law of the universe which forces them to do so. That's a fact. It can't be disputed. So those who say that all money creation automatically comes with interest and that therefore the interest can never be paid are simply wrong. Money creation by private entities, the banks, does come with interest payments because a private entity has to be profitable or else it will eventually go out of business. But that's not the case for a government, which has the power to make money and can never go out of business. In fact, if the government decides to pay interest on some of the money it creates in the form of government bonds, those interest payments are also created by the government out of nothing. So. It is a liability on their balance sheet, and people like to get all worked up about the national debt, but the liability of the public sector by the rules of accounting is the assets of the private sector. All that money created into the private sector, which adds up to an asset on the private sector's balance sheet, is a liability to the government, but the government can handle it as long as there are resources in that nation to support the spending, to support what they're trying to do. Resources to build the road, for instance. They can, if they don't have enough engineers or laborers or con uh, concrete, then no amount of money creation is going to make that road happen. But if the resources are there, then they can create the money, the assets, to make that road happen and the liability on their side. The spending ultimately just moves around the resources, just like in the example of creating roads or bike paths. And the most important resources are those gifts given to the people. And if those gifts are being forced to be idle due to unemployment, then the government is not, by definition, is not overspending. It's underspending. It can, it can spend more and engage those people to use their gifts in productive ways without causing inflation. Of course, if it spends to have people engage their gifts in unproductive ways or counterproductive ways, then that will cause problems and it will cause inflation. Creating too much money to just give away to, let's say, the military is not productive of food or infrastructure. I'm not saying that we shouldn't have any defense of a country. Of course we should. But if you create money excessively and give it away to things that doesn't create food to feed people, doesn't create roads or infrastructure or post offices that can make businesses more productive and more efficient, then that creation of money will be counterproductive and can and will be inflationary. And creating money to hand to the finance sector in the form of welfare to Wall Street is similarly unproductive and inflationary. Creating money to do unproductive things is a problem, but creating money to enhance infrastructure is productive and helps reduce the cost of doing business, and helps enable men and women to create businesses and to express the gifts that they were given by heaven. The natural resources and the infrastructure of a nation belong to the people. And it's the proper role of their elected representatives, or in ancient times, the proper role of the king or the queen to protect those resources for the benefit of the people. Oligarchs always want to capture those resources and capture that infrastructure for their own benefit because it's extremely lucrative for them to do so. And the ancient myths talk about bad kings who enable that to happen instead of doing what their proper role is. In a recent interview, Professor Michael Hudson explains that the most lucrative of all the parts of the infrastructure to capture is the, uh, the credit creation ability, the right to create 
money, which is why the privatization of banking is so lucrative. But the government can and should be the primary source of credit for a nation, the primary source of money creation, to the degree that it refrains from doing its proper role and instead awards that power to private oligarchs, it's going to enrich those oligarchs and impoverish the people. Access to credit is part of the infrastructure of the nation. It's one of the most important parts of the infrastructure. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't have any private credit creation. I'm not saying that. But you can also have a public banking in conjunction with private banking. And that would serve as a check to the private uh, runaway, private creation of credit that's been going on. So now I hope we see the issue that we should really be focused on. The meme as presented is very misleading. What the meme should say is that bank credit issued by a private bank rather than a public bank necessarily comes with interest. It has to because the private entity has to stay in business. It can't loan money for nothing and still pay its employees. It'll eventually go out of business if it does that. Too little government money creation is going to create a shortage that's going to lead to two very terrible ills in society. It's going to lead to excessive private debt on the population, and it's going to lead to excessive unemployment in the population. And we have both of those symptoms in the United States today. In fact, we have them both in epidemic proportions and in many other countries as well. The solution is to understand that unemployment is 100% curable through increased government spending. Involuntary unemployment is 100% curable through increased government spending. Government spending creates money without a corresponding required interest payment because the liability is sitting on the government balance sheet, not on a private balance sheet somewhere. And government spending is an asset to the private balance sheet, not a liability. So this, this argument that all debt, all money is debt and, and a liability to the people is not correct. Bank loans, when they create money, create a liability on a private balance sheet, on your balance sheet in the case of your home mortgage, for example. Government spending is not excessive if there are still homeless people in the streets and unemployment in the economy. Government spending is too little if we have those two things. Government spending can be done in unproductive ways which don't reduce unemployment and don't reduce homelessness and don't reduce indebtedness in the population. So it has to be done in productive ways, which during this crisis it has not been done. And over the past 40 years or more, especially since the rise of hardcore neoliberalism and austerity and the absolute abandonment of keeping up with the infrastructure, government spending in productive ways has not been done. But if it is done in a productive way, then government spending can reduce private sector indebtedness and it can eliminate the scourge of unemployment, which will absolutely destroy any society. So who is against you knowing this information? Obviously, those who are for oligarchy and against democracy tend to be against people knowing this information. Those who would prefer to enrich themselves at the expense of the entire population, at the expense of the men and women and children to whom the resources of a nation are actually given by heaven. But we should focus our attention primarily on the system, the system the way it's laid out, on the, the way the traffic lights are arranged, so to speak. The, the people, most of the people are not arranging the system. They're just making choices within the system. But there are people who have an interest in setting up the system a certain way. That's who I'm talking about. Not someone who chooses to go work for a bank because the way the traffic lights are laid out, they make that choice. I'm talking about the way the traffic lights are, the whole pattern of the traffic lights, that's what we need to look at and focus on. The vast majority of the people 
understanding the way things really work, will want to set up the system, set up the traffic lights in a way so that it benefits everyone. But there are a few who would prefer to set it up so that the natural resources that are given to everyone will benefit just them, so that they can capture them at the and benefit themselves at the expense of everyone else. But the proper role of government, whether it's a democracy or government with a king, is to prevent that on behalf of the good of the entire land. And we can see that in the world's ancient wisdom given to every culture on earth. For instance, in the Odyssey, we have a very clear depiction of this problem in the form of the freeloading suitors who are devouring the household of Odysseus while plotting to seduce his wife and murder his son and who are constantly attempting, they're constantly trying to justify their own behavior, but their actions are explicitly shown and described as being hateful to the gods. They are the very picture of oligarchy which seeks to exploit the wealth of others and to oppress and terrorize anyone who stands in their way. And they are eventually destroyed by the return of the king. In the Odyssey, they're eventually destroyed by the return of Odysseus, who's aided and inspired by the gods, and in particular by the goddess of wisdom, Athena. If you want to learn more about the money function and the creation of money and the link between spending and employment, I highly recommend that you check out the work of Warren Mosler on his website at Mosler Economics, and especially under his Required Readings tab on that website, where he makes his books and publications available at no cost to you. Some cost to him, I, I imagine but he makes them available for free on his website. I would also recommend the work of Professor Michael Hudson and Professor William or Bill Mitchell of Australia and Professor Stephanie Kelton in the United States. I would also argue and can show with abundant evidence that all of this is actually explained and dramatized in the world's ancient wisdom given in the ancient myths, which are designed to uplift men and women, to stand against injustice and exploitation, and to be a blessing to our lives, a blessing which we need in this very present moment, even to this day, in fact, especially to this day, and which can be shown to be based on the stars and the heavenly cycles, the stars which continue to turn above our heads in the heavenly cycles, which continue going on just as they have for millennia. The truth is up there, and the truth will prevail. Thank you for watching.